And welcome everybody. Uh, thank you indeed for joining us for this uh, first virtual. Uh, thank you to Zoom for this amazing invention. And we are coping as we all are. First of all, I just want to pray and hope that all of you are enjoying relatively good health in these testing times. And thank you uh, for joining us uh, this morning. So, as Mark said, I am a very proud uh, member of the uh, County Retirement Association. Um, I worked in the county for 25 years as a deputy BA, retiring from that office in March of 2018. Just a little more about my background. Uh, I was raised in Southern England, and there's a picture of my high school, uh, Colliers, which was founded in the 15th century. And I am convinced that my history teacher was one of those founding teachers because he was pretty old. Um, I graduated from high school in 1969. And in the summer of 69, I went to my local cinema and I watched a film which changed my life, Easy Rider. It, it, it totally changed my whole perspective about what the United States was all about. And as a result, I was very curious and I wanted to find out for myself. So I started traveling every summer after 1969 over to the United States. In uh, 1970, I started my law degree. In England, you go straight from high school to law school. No undergraduate stuff. You just go straight there at age 18 and spend three years trying to figure out what the law is all about. So I went to Leeds University and it's claim to fame for any of you who are the fans of the great group, The Who will have that album, I'm sure sitting somewhere in your cupboard called Live at Leeds, and that's where it was recorded at my university. Um, after I went to university, I um, decided one thing uh, that I learned from law school, which was I don't want to be a lawyer. So I didn't become a lawyer, I went to Peace Corps, and I spent two years in Kenya as a teacher, and this man who I'm with right now in this photo taught me more than anybody else about how you break down barriers of culture, race, economics, social strata, and I owe him uh, so much. So then I came back and I had to make this decision, do I become a barrister or do I become a solicitor? Because that's the choice you have in England between those two professions. And I decided to become a barrister. But then after I put the wig on and the gown, it didn't look very good. So I quit being a barrister and I became a general lawyer a general practitioner called a solicitor, and I focused primarily on criminal law. That's the only part of the law I've ever enjoyed, and so that became my um, career for 13 years in the UK. Interestingly enough, in the UK, you can spend some of your time being a defense criminal lawyer and some of the time being a prosecutor, and I really actually think that's a, a smart idea because one of the concerns I've always had in the DA's office is that we recruit very young uh, lawyers, sometimes straight out of law school, and that's all they know is being, a, is being a prosecutor. And sometimes, I've seen it, you get tunnel vision, and so I'm just appreciative of the years that I spent uh, in the criminal defense world, as well as obviously my career as a prosecutor. So, um, sorry, I had a little bit of trouble getting my uh, thing to connect here. There's, oh dear. Um, this is this is the nightmare when you have uh, something that goes wrong. Just bear with me one second here, because um, I don't think it's going to work. Oh, there it goes. Whew. So, how did I become a San Diego uh, prosecutor? Well, as they say, the best stories are once upon a time, a young Englishman met a young lady from Southern California. Ah. Oh. Oh, well, I mean, you've heard that story, <laughs> right? Well, he just copied what I was able to do. So during my Easy Rider experiments, traveling around America, I came to San Diego in uh, August of 1973. I just graduated from law school, came on a Saturday and a Sunday. And on the Sunday morning, I was in University City and I went to a Baptist church. And I walked in and I didn't know anybody in the young adult Sunday school program. And I looked around the room and the only empty seat was sitting next to this gorgeous young lady. And I sat down next to her and married her. Well, five years later, we got married in San Diego, in La Jolla. 
and came back uh, uh, after the honeymoon to start our life in the UK. She's the love of my life and we've been married for almost 42 years. And so that's the reason why I now live just north of San Diego in uh, Escondido. So we left the UK in 1991. By that time, we had two children. Uh, Rebecca was 10 and Stephen was four. I, I quit a partnership in a law firm in England, flew to San Diego, jobless, unqualified. So what did I have to do? I had to do what a thousand other law, uh, law students had to do. I had to sit for the bar exam. And I sat for the bar exam in August of uh, 1991 and thankfully I fooled the bar examiners enough to think that I knew more than I really did and fortunately the good news uh, I passed the bar in the November uh, oh dear. so I joined a civil law firm uh, for two years and then realized it wasn't for me so in 1993 I rushed down to the county administration building because the DA's office had just lifted their hiring freeze. And I must have told them so many times, I want to be a prosecutor. I, I need to be a deputy DA. Now they took a big risk with me. I was the very first resident alien that they'd ever hired in the DA's office to be a prosecutor. And I only had my green card and thankfully I'm now a citizen, but at the time it was a big risk for them. And I'm so glad that they took that risk with me. That's thanks to Mr. Ed Miller and his uh, colleagues. So at first I was downtown doing uh, preliminary hearings. They then sent me to Juvie Court and I'm glad to see Jody there um, because she was one of my victim advocates. And then they sent me to South Bay and then I was on the three strikes team downtown. And then suddenly my whole career changed overnight when the DA, Paul Finks, called me into his office and told me that I was going to start a whole new assignment. By the way, we are so progressive in San Diego County, as you know, and one of the best pioneering efforts we've ever done is using support animals, dogs, in the courtroom. Uh, we were one of the very first courts in the whole country to do this, and thanks to Lynn, who's shown there in the middle of the photograph, who was a at that time, an uh, injured police officer, she, it was her inspiration that allowed all this program to develop. So this has been a wonderful program that I'm very proud to brag about when I do online um, webinars for other people. We also realized that when I started the Elder Abuse Prosecution Unit that we needed to make a room comfortable for seniors. So we completely stripped uh, uh, an office uh, in our um, DA's office, and we turned it into a more of a living room for the older population. We realized they needed to watch their soap operas. So we put in a TV, we put in a sofa, put in a kettle, and try to make it as comfortable as possible. So I can honestly tell you that in 25 years, I did not at all have one day when I wanted to leave. I loved every minute of the job. Um, even when it was very challenging, I loved it. And I was so proud to be known as a deputy district attorney working for what I consider to be the finest prosecutor's office in the whole country. So why on earth would I leave? Well, it's all about numbers. You see, I had just celebrated my 25th year uh, work anniversary. And I looked at that number, and I think you would agree, look at that number. Does that look nice? It looks much nicer than 27 or 29. I decided, yeah, 25, that's a good number to leave on. This number also impacted my decision to leave. You see, I just turned 66 in March of 2018. And as many of you know, when you're in full-time employment in the county and you turn 66, there's something that wonderful that you could take advantage of called social security. You know what my favorite day of the month is? The third Wednesday. That, it really works. And so when I added in my county investment to my social security, it seemed to make sense. Now, I think we're all in that age category where you will relate to this next slide. The only downside to being 66 is that things change. I wanna take you back 40 years, okay? Look at that column on the left. Do you relate to that? Look at the column on the right. Do you see how things change? And, um, you know, it's true. And many of us could relate to that right now in terms of uh, 
what we've experienced over the last 40 years. This number also impacted my decision to leave the office. No, 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 this is not my county pension, okay? Despite what you read in the papers, no, I am not milking the system. This is not me. This is another headline that I got in 2018. And you know what it said? This. Now, this is a pretty startling um, headline, isn't it? But when I read this headline, it was consistent with what I, the phone calls that I was getting. Suddenly, in early 2018, I was getting more and more phone calls from all over the country, from social services, from adult protective services, from ombudsmen, from police agencies, from prosecutors, and they were all saying the same thing. Mr. Greenwood, we are seeing a huge increase in the number of cases of suspected financial elder abuse. We hear that you've been running a program for several years. Can you come out to our jurisdiction and help us start a similar program? And I felt that I tried to do it with my day job, but it was obviously very taxing and very difficult to do. So I decided, you know what? I've been mentoring a younger energetic prosecutor for eight years. His name is Scott Perello. He is a brilliant, brilliant prosecutor. I knew it would be in good hands. And I felt this was the time for me to spread my wings and share the information that I had been learning for the last 22 years of prosecuting these crimes with a wider audience. So that's what I've been doing for the last two years. Well, um, I say spread my wings. I was spreading my wings last year. My wife and I were able to travel to about 30 states and do some teaching. And then I was able to also speak in Wales and in uh, Brisbane, Australia last year. But this year, it's Escondido or nothing. Escondido or bust. But thanks to Zoom, I'm reaching other people. Yesterday, I was privileged enough to speak to 255 prosecutors from the state of Virginia, all from this uh, amazing invention called Zoom. So it is a problem. Uh, 37 billion was the uh, quote from 2018. This is what it was like in 2015, apparently. This is what the crooks are stealing every year, apparently, from our older population. This number also impacted my decision to leave the office. You know, life can be weird, can't it? You fall in love with somebody and then you say, darling, I want to spend the rest of my life with you. And then what happens? Half your life, you're never with them because of something called work. So we decided to make it uh, a gift to each other on our 40th wedding anniversary that we would indeed spend more time together. And that's been a, a reality come true, especially with uh, lockdown in the last uh, six months. So getting back to what I was doing for 22 years, that journey began in January of 1996. So I'd been in the office almost three years. Finks called me into his office and told me that he just had a very angry phone call from Adult Protective Services, who were telling him that our office was ignoring a huge escalating crime called elder abuse. I asked him, what is it? What is elder abuse? He says, I don't know, but you're about to find out because I've just named you as the head of our brand new unit called Elder Abuse prosecution. So this became my assignment for the next 22 years. And it's very unusual for any prosecutor to spend 22 years doing only one type of criminal prosecution. Very, very unusual. So why did I do that? Two reasons. And here they are. My mom and my dad. It's as simple as that. Um, my dad, this, is, this was taken on his 90th birthday. Sadly, my my dad was diagnosed with Alzheimer's when he was 79, and for the last six years of his life, he was in a memory care facility about a mile from my parents' home. On his birthday, we rented a very old car, and we transported him from the facility back to his beloved home, where my mother greeted him, and we had a wonderful afternoon sitting in the garden um, and just uh, having a good time with my dad. I lost him uh, when he was 92, um, and sadly, I lost my mum last November, aged 96. Uh, she was an extraordinary lady, full of energy, full of discipline, a tough lady. She survived the blitz. But my dad, this is what I think of my dad, not as an Alzheimer's victim, but as a hero. My dad was a B-25 bomber pilot in World War II. He survived 79 bombing missions over Europe. Everything went okay except for mission number four. No, it was mission number six on June 4th, 
1944. He was shot down over the Adriatic. He was almost drowned, but thankfully he managed to get out of the cockpit and float to the surface where he was rescued by Yugoslav fishermen. And that's how I grew up, with stories like that from my dad and from my mum. And as a result, I gained a huge respect for my parents' generation. And so when I entered this area of prosecuting elder abuse and being responsible in the county of San Diego for trying to pursue justice on behalf of older adults, most of the victims that I came in contact with were of my parents' generation. And so that's what led me to stay into this for the next, next 22 years. But here's the problem. When I first started out in 1996, they gave me everything a prosecutor needs, right? A phone, an office, a yellow pad, a computer, except one thing. Oh, duplication. No cases, not one. Typically in, in our office, it's a police agency that will bring in the case or a sheriff's department. And that happened all the time, except when I was given this new assignment, not one police officer, not one detective came into my office with a case. This is what I was dealing with, silence. And that's why adult protective services were so frustrated because no cases were being investigated, no cases were being prosecuted. This a poster comes from Illinois and it, it became my theme for the next 22 years. How can I break through this wall of silence? And what I found extraordinary is that even though California had an elder abuse law that had been in existence since, now some of you already know this, but it's important that all of us on this call know what the code section for elder abuse is. Why is that? Because if you ever talk to a cop, you will know that cops never use words, they only use numbers. So they never talk about a burglary, they only talk about a 459. They never talk about a murder, they only talk about a 187. They never talk about a robbery, they only use 211, because these are all the code sections that are identified with the crime. So why is it important that you should know the code section for elder abuse? Because if you have to make a call to report a suspected crime of elder abuse, when you tell them the number of the code section, that gives you instant recognition and respect from law enforcement. And that code number is 368. So under that code, there are two types of victims, elders and dependent adults. Now in California, we define an elder as anybody over the age of 65. Now, another reason why I quit the office two years ago was because in the last three cases that I prosecuted, all my victims were younger than me. Now that's not good, okay? Um, so I'm now 68, so I'm well into that category. But yesterday with Virginia, you know what their definition of advanced age is? 60. This is ridiculous. Um, there are three states in America that have got it right. Uh, that They define an elder as 70. Kansas and Colorado and one other, which I've forgotten about. So, we make it 65. Dependent adults, anyone aged 18 through 64 with a mental or a physical limitation. And it was so important, and I'm so glad that our code section included people with disabilities. So I had to learn a new skill uh, during this assignment of how to question a victim with cerebral palsy, a, vic a victim uh, with some other kind of uh, challenge. And, and I'm so grateful that I was able to, to uh, be trained in that area. So this code section covers a whole variety of crimes, physical abuse, mental abuse, neglect, financial exploitation, and false imprisonment. But one thing I always had to bear in mind is I always had to prove that the defendant knew or reasonably should have known that his victim was either 65 or older or someone with a disability. And that was a key in any case that I had to prove beyond a reasonable doubt. So how do we go back, back to breaking through this wall of silence that I've been talking about? Canada said it well. They said elder abuse 
thrives on silence. The Attorney General for Kansas has called elder abuse the silent epidemic of our time. Because of that silence, I had to begin a, a sharp learning curve. I had to start going out from my office because I wasn't prosecuting any cases because nobody was bringing them to me. So I had to go and talk to people. And I started to learn all these things, that it was a crime, that we weren't prosecuting it, but that the stories I was hearing were so predictable. And it was affecting not only San Diego or Carlsbad or Escondido, it was affecting Borrego Springs, it was affecting all the outlying rural areas in East County, as well as in the more uh, urban areas. And I realized too, that we were at the beginning of, of a new program where child abuse and domestic violence were 40 years before. But also I was realizing it was an escalating problem because of demographics, because of the aging of America. Look at this, by the year 2030, there'll be over 70 million people in this country, all driving Buicks. And do you know what, every day in America, do you know how many people turn 65 in one day? 10,000. Also, we're all living longer. Some of us on this call will live to be 100. And we're all hoping that SD Sarah will be with us until we're 100. I think it will, but that's what we're praying for, right? But guess what? By 2030, this number of people over the age of 100 will uh, explode to 130,000. And if you don't believe me that people are living longer, just turn on NBC any weekday. Did you know that if you eat Smuckers for breakfast, you will live to be 100? It's a known fact. Look at it. Well, my favorite centenarian is this lady. Isn't she wonderful? I'm not endorsing it, but it's a true story. She lived to be 103. This is also a telling fact. By the year 2035, there'll be more people in this country over the age of 65 than children. That is very telling. And yet, here's the problem. Despite all the obvious demographics, we're not spending money statewide, federally, on elder justice enough compared to what we spend on other programs. So that's what we're tackling right now. So we are exploding this problem because of demographics, because of the fact that we don't have a cure for all forms of dementia or Parkinson's and the fact that our victims are staying silent. So we've got to understand the challenges, the fact that so many of our friends, relatives, people living in our street who are older people who are victims are too afraid to come forward. That's why the responsibility lies in our hands to keep a lookout for those of us who are less fortunate and who become victims of some form of elder abuse. So faced with this problem of silence, I had to quickly change my role as a prosecutor. You know, we teach prosecutors to be reactive, to react to cases that they bring to our office, but there were no cases. So I had to become proactive and I had to start networking out in the community. I had to start driving to places that I had never heard of before. There's a place called Fallbrook. Did you know that in the county of San Diego? And there's a place called Rainbow, Borrego Springs, um, Boulevard. I mean, all these places that, that need to, to, you need to reach. And I needed to drive to all these different places and talk to people in the community. And I realized also, if we were to be effective, we had to build a team. And you build it through collaboration, cooperation, and through communication. So I began with this, what I call triangular concept, dealing with these three key agencies, social services, and I dealt with adult protective services, the Ombudsman and the public guardian, traditional law enforcement, as well as my colleagues within the DA's office, city attorney's office, the attorney general's office, and across the street, at the federal US attorney's office. We started a campaign called Silence Isn't Golden. We used red for physical abuse. We used green for financial abuse. And we used blue for neglect. And that became a very successful campaign. Uh, and we put these posters, and you may have seen them, throughout the county in public areas. 
But even though we were doing that, still, unfortunately, the problem existed that we were still overlooking a lot of victims. Sometimes we weren't even believing their stories, simply sometimes abandoning them. And, and that did not sit well with many of us. And so we realized we had to, uh, we had a challenge on our hands. By the first year, end of the first year, I had finally started issue about 17 cases. By the time I left, we were approximately issuing about 450 felony and misdemeanor cases. So, so you can see that we've definitely uh, produced more. 65% of those cases involve some kind of financial exploitation. But of all the physical abuse cases that I dealt with, the number one problem, and it still is today, is this person, the son, living at home with his widowed mother. He's either divorced, come back, single, never left, or just got released from prison. In every single case almost, he is lazy and unemployed. And he's also got an addiction to drugs, alcohol, or gambling. And because he needs money for those addictions, he steals from his mother. And when she finds out, he is confronted, and that's when the violence begins. You know, Tennessee said it right. They said, what do you call someone who abuses an 80-year-old woman? She called him son. And then, as I said, 65% of all my cases involve some form of financial exploitation. It starts with family theft. The son, the daughter, um, stealing from their elderly parents. And what was really troubling for me was that some of these cases started out as theft, but ended up, unfortunately, as a homicide. Some of you will recall this terrible case that I prosecuted a few years ago. This was the victim. She lived just above the uh, Qualcomm Stadium. A lovely, wonderful lady, the matriarch of a, uh, an Afghan refugee family who was murdered uh, after she went missing. Um, she was murdered by her own uh, daughter who was a drug addict. And it was my privilege to take that case in front of Jeffrey Frazier, the judge, uh, to trial. And then we've got caregiver theft. And, and, and why do we have so many caregivers who steal from older adults? Because look what they have access to, jewelry, which is converted into cash. They assume that the victim is not gonna press charges and they justify the taking. And just like with the family members, these cases can sometimes lead to homicide. Do you remember this case out of San Diego? This caregiver stole over $590,000 from an elderly man in Rancho Bernardo. We've never found his body, but she murdered him and she's now serving life without the possibility of parole. This gentleman, uh, his name is Jack Parks on the left. Uh, this was taken on his 97th birthday. I prosecuted his caregiver for murdering him. He lived out in Mission Gorge in a very nice mobile home. She beat him, she kicked him, and ultimately he died and she was convicted of second degree murder because she stole from him and they had a confrontation. Do you remember this fellow? He was a hero, Pearl Harbor survivor. He was isolated by his caregiver in the East County. And thankfully, neighbors called Adult Protective Services, who in turn called the sheriff, who in turn broke down the door and found him laying in filth in the kitchen, almost uh, dead. How did she get away with it for so long? She isolated him from his neighbors by putting up signs like this and all the time stealing his money from the bank. And then I dealt with a whole bunch of contractor fraud cases. You know, I still remember this one. This, this was in North County where the crook called himself Father and Daughter's Christian Construction Company. Now, where would you put this flyer? You'd put it in a church parking lot, right? And what vehicle would you put it on? You would not put it on the F-150 pickup truck. Which one do you put it on? You put it on the Buick because you know that the driver of the Buick is gonna be over the age of 75. And that's how you get your victims. And the victims will come to you because they think you are a Christian and therefore they think you are somebody who can be trusted. I also prosecuted a licensed uh, contractor company who sent out technicians who ripped off elderly victims, charging them ridiculous amounts of money um, for a simple, uh, garage door repair. They would 
con the victims into thinking they were a, a local company. So they used uh, 760, 619, 858 area codes, but in fact, the call always went to Dallas, Texas, and they would send out a technician. But we got, uh, we got a prosecution on that one, and he was convicted. Even a San Diego store owner in La Jolla, um, who took baby grand pianos from elderly people who were downsizing, they would give their pianos to this guy who owned this store in Bird Rock, and they thought he was going to sell the piano. Oh, no, he didn't sell. He stole their pianos. And unfortunately, when they went to the police, what did the police say? They just said it was a civil matter, which it wasn't. You know how I found out about this case? From Michael Turco on KUSI. He did a story on it. That's how I found out about it. And that's who I contacted to get the information so that I could then prosecute the uh, Peter Schroeder, who was the owner of the piano store in La Jolla, for theft and embezzlement. What about theft by professional advisors? This guy was one of the worst, Jeffrey Milton. He was supposedly a, a licensed insurance salesman, and he conned the IRS into giving him a charity, a 501c3 charity. And he made up this fancy brochure called Senior Rescue and conned a lot of people out of money. But even your bank, we prosecuted a Chase Bank employee from Imperial Beach for stealing over $300,000 from her elderly customers. Professional guardians or conservators, which is a big problem right now. And um, the, one of the biggest ones you should know about is called April Parks. If you're interested in this subject, you should read this uh, article from the New Yorker magazine. You can email me and I'll send you the link. It's fascinating, but it's also very scary. And you can also download this documentary from iTunes or Amazon Prime called The Guardians. But in San Diego, we had our own problem. Uh, she was on our multidisciplinary team, and she, unknown to us, she, was, she had a big gambling problem, and she was stealing from her clients. So there's also a problem with what I call opportunistic uh, theft uh, through distraction thefts. Now, the next time you go to the uh, store, particularly Trader Joe's, Whole Foods, or Vons or Albertsons, be very careful about this, because as you see in this uh, video, here comes the crook, she's wearing a hat, and she works in conjunction with this uh, co-conspirator who's standing next to the victim. Now watch the cart, Lock the, see the lady's purse in the cart? Look, the crook goes in there, unzips the purse, and whips out the wallet, and off she goes. So please do not leave your purse in your cart because there are people out there today who want to steal your uh, wallet. And then what about posing as an official? You know, uh, I prosecuted a case where the guy uh, came to the elderly woman's home in Point Loma Boulevard dressed as an FBI agent. Now, how do you dress as an FBI agent? You put on designer sunglasses, you wear a fancy suit, shiny shoes, and you create a fake badge. And you also create a fake business card. You then identify yourself as an FBI agent and convince your victim to go to her bank and withdraw all her cash because she, her money is being stolen by a bank employee and you are gonna help her trace who that bank employee is. Um, thankfully, we caught him. And his name, of course, was, wasn't Ross Walker. When we arrested him, we did a search warrant on his house. Now, this is an example of, that, of the fact that so many crooks are stupid. Look, this guy even had to have a script reminding him that we are with the FBI, flash the badge. Duh. And then there are the scams, okay? Scam after scam. You know, there are so many um, pl places you can turn to online to learn about these scams. And here's one. The top 10 most reported scams last year were these. And some of them, you've had the call from Social Security, other robocalls, lottery scams, romance scams, the grandparent scam, things like that. The hottest one uh, until COVID was the sweetheart scam. 
it has an impact on all of us. And, and there are, I know there are retired county employees who have become victims of this romance scam. And my advice to anyone is do not go on to a website to meet somebody because unfortunately the crooks love those websites uh, and they will steal somebody else's identity. They will put up a, a, an image. They will convince you that they are somebody that they're, they're not really. And it's all, it all goes wrong. So guard your wallet as well as your heart. I love this slide. She met him online. He said he lived in the gated community. Yes, he did. It was called a prison. And believe me, they are conducting these romance scams from within prison walls. How do I know that? They smuggle cell phones into prisons in California very, very easily. And that's what they're doing from within the prison. They are doing these romance scams. And so there's the sweepstakes scam. You've just won the lottery. You know how that works. A few years ago, I got this email from a retired Catholic priest. He became a victim. Now, this is an unusual email because most victims of the sweepstakes scam never want to admit it because they're too embarrassed. This gentleman, thankfully, came to us. We investigated it and we located the suspect. There he is. He's in Greenville, South Carolina. He had just received $41,000 from my retired priest in San Diego but he created the account with a false name and a false social security number. But at least we knew what he looked like. We sent this photo to 50, uh, over 50 law enforcement agencies around Greenville and bingo, we located him and then we extradited him back from uh, the East Coast. One of my victims got this envelope from Chicago. Well, it says Chicago, but look on the right. You can prove that he did not come from Chicago because it has a French postmark. It came from Montreal, Quebec. Inside was a letter congratulating her. She just won a million dollars from Pepsi. Inside the letter was a check. It was bogus and you know how that goes. And then we've got the grandma scam and you know how that goes too. And uh, uh, I don't have time to show you the video, but one of our own people became a victim of a grandma scam. It's happening all the time. So I always tell people, if you get a call from somebody claiming to be your grandson, hang up. Number one, your grandchild will never be in jail. Or number two, if they are in jail, let them stay there, okay? Don't go and fall for the scam because it is a scam and they want you to, to send iTunes card, uh, the, the numbers on the back to the crooks to pay for, quote, the bail money. Watch out for investment scams, particularly in these times of investment crisis. Um, we have this case, which I prosecuted about two and a half, three years ago. This lady was from uh, North County. She was one of several victims from all over the country who fell for the gemstone scam. And the crook was living in a $2.3 million house house in Rancho Santa Fe. Fortunately, he's not now. He's living in a state-sponsored bars. Um, watch out for all these pitches, love economic crises. And we are going through an economic crisis right now, so don't fall for that. And now, of course, what are we dealing with? We're dealing with the coronavirus scams. The crooks gravitate from tragedy to tragedy. They convert a crisis that we're facing into a gold mine for themselves. So be wary of any emails claiming to be from CDC or from the World Health Organization. They are fake. Ignore all these online offers for vaccinations or a mini cure. You may have seen Jim Backer, that old TV evangelist, touting a miracle cure. Don't believe it. It's all bogus. And be wary about a phone call or a text that you are getting from supposedly a contact tracer who is gonna tell you uh, about the fact that you may have come into contact with a positive uh, test person. Real contact tracers in San Diego County may well ask for your name and address on the phone. They may ask for health information, name of places and people that you've been in touch with. Scammers will ask you for much more. 
They will ask for financial information about yourself. They will ask you to click on something or download something. That is all bogus and fake. So we need to understand the difference between a real contact tracer and a fraudulent one. And, and I would just urge all of us to use great caution whenever getting a call back from somebody claiming to be a contact tracer. And if you do come across any uh, uh, COVID scams, please make sure that you contact the National Center for Disaster Fraud. They, there's the hotline. And just remember, NCDF, National Center for Disaster Fraud, you can always make that call and tell them of any scam that you have heard about or that you've experienced that is COVID-19 related. So what, as I wrap this up, and hopefully we'll have time for some questions that you are gonna give us in the chat box, which I hope, what can we do? I've learned over all these years that it takes all of us, it takes a community, to keep our elders safe. I've learned over the years that it's no good me going out on a tangent. I need to be part of a team. And you know, we are on a team because we are part of a retirement community in the county of San Diego. And I have to give a great shout out to the Retirement Association and to SD Sarah. You know, I wouldn't be able to do what I'm doing right now, which is sharing my passion with other prosecutors around the country with other agencies, if it were not for the wonderful um, planning that they've done in my retirement. And I, I, I think many of us in the association should recognize and appreciate what the others have been doing for us. I do every day. I wake up and I am very thankful for the secure retirement pension that I've got over the last 25 years. And I think there are times when we need to show our appreciation to, to the folks. But anyway, getting back to the teamwork approach, please be aware of your elderly neighbors. I just want to take a moment. After my three hour, uh, hour webinar yesterday, I was just kind of coming down from a high. The phone rang. My wife answered it. It was our neighbor across the street. She's 89. She was in distress. She said, is Paul home? And Sue said, yes. I went over to see what was the problem. She had just come back from her bank and had withdrawn $23,000 and that was sitting in her living room because she was under the impression that she was, her money was about to be stolen from the bank and she had been in conversation for the last three days on the phone with what she believed to be a Chase Bank fraud investigator. And he had told her to tell nobody about this problem. And she was literally about to get in her car and go to Albertsons and purchase $23,000 worth of gift cards. Thankfully, she called me first. I took her back to the bank. I, we redeposited the money into a new account. But I also told the bank that I was disappointed that they had allowed my 89-year-old neighbor to walk out of their bank three hours earlier with $23,000 in cash. That should never, ever be allowed to happen. They should have done more to sit her down in a private room and grill her as to why she needed to do that. So we've got to be aware of our circumstances and our neighbors. Look out for red flags. Look out for any changes in their behavior or in their routine. We're all creatures of habit. We all do things pretty much the same way. If you see a neighbor who's elderly suddenly change their, their, their pattern of behavior, that's a red flag. Look for any work being done on their roof, on their driveway, anything, especially where the person working is in an unmarked white uh, pickup truck. Be nosy. Take a photo of the license plate because it's possible that that person is going to be a victim of some kind of fraud. Um, if they start telling you about a new friend or about a distant relative who suddenly re-emerged in their life, red flag. I have top 10 tips for reducing the risk of becoming a victim. I don't have time to go through those today, but if ever you want them, I'll be more than happy to send them to you. 
So in the remaining minutes, uh, what I'm just going to share you is this, um, and then give you my contact information, and then I'm going to hand back to, to Mark. So is there elder abuse going on right now in San Diego County? It, it, there is. There's a massive amount going on. Thankfully, and you should be proud of this, as I am proud, we live in a county where the district attorney, Summer Stephan, has made elder abuse and the protection of older adults a priority. I can't speak too highly of Summer. She is a wonderful person and a wonderful prosecutor. I'm proud to, to know her and I will be supporting her every way I can because she really has got a tough task right now, but she has made elder abuse prosecution a big priority. We must continue the path we've been on to make sure that victims of elder abuse don't get forgotten. And, and we want to try to reach as many as we can and we can only do that because remember, many of these victims are not going to say anything. They're going to be too embarrassed, too afraid to come forward. Thankfully, my neighbor had the courage to call us yesterday. Had she not done so, within an hour, she would have been $23,000 poorer. Because once those gift cards have, have been uh, purchased, and once she's given the numbers to the crook, it's all over for her. So we need to understand how these crimes impact our older neighbors, friends, family members in so many different ways. You know, we've heard tragic stories of people actually committing suicide once they realize they're a victim of some kind of scam. We do not want that to happen. And so I always leave this message for older adults in San Diego. I say, you know what, in San Diego, we prosecute with the three Ps, passion, purpose, and perseverance. Before I hand it back to Mark, I just want to give a shout out to some of the colleagues that I've seen on the list. I, I, I saw Patricia's name on there. She was a court interpreter, had some great uh, interpretations through Pat. Thank you so much. I saw Bruce on there, uh, Bruce Silver. He was a colleague of mine. Good to see you, Bruce. And I also saw Olivia Gillum came on the line and she was a great public defender, alternate public defender who I had several trials with. And so it's great to see you too. So thank you all for being here. I'm going to give you my information. Feel free to text me or to email me. If you come across a situation, I'm more than happy to be the conduit for you to make sure that the information gets to the right person in the right department. With that, Mark, I'm going to hand it back to you and see if we have any uh, questions that we can take care of. Thank you very much, Paul. I would actually unmute and let everybody uh, do a round of applause, but that might get a little, uh, <laughs> a little noisy with the background. But I'm, I'm giving you a virtual applause for a great, great job, Paul, and so appreciated. And thank you, Paul. Uh, yeah, and we actually have, I actually have one question, then another couple. One request, actually, wanted to see if you wouldn't mind. Somebody asked if we could share your PowerPoint presentation. Uh, most of it, um, you know, some of it is like the personal things of my dad and my mom. Right, and, right. And, but I will certainly send you, Mark, a uh, sort of a reduced version of it with the words. Certainly, I'll, I'll be ha happy to send, and particularly the top 10 tips, which I didn't have yeah. time to get to. I would love to share that with you. That'd be great. And also, um, we, I was able to jot down the Federal Trade Commission coronavirus website, and I just looked it up. So we'll also be posting some information on the ResDeck website. At the top of the website, you just click on resources, give us a few days, and we'll get that uh, information posted. That, that contact tracer flyer was kind of a neat thing. Um, so that's another one. So uh, first question. And thank you, everyone, for participating today again. Um, I hope everybody, I, I forgot to mention this at the top, but I hope everybody is staying safe, um, hanging in there. We're going to get through this all together. Uh, it's with subject matter experts and, and uh, people like Paul that have committed their lives to uh, protecting the interests of, of uh, seniors and uh, elders that uh, are victims of this horrible abuse. Um, and by having these types of presentations, we hope to be able to bring that, that level of information to all of you going forward. The next question is, Paul, are banks mandated reporters of elder financial abuse? Yes, they are. Every single employee of a bank or a credit union is a mandated reporter. That was legislation that I was uh, fortunate enough to be a uh, part of. Uh, it took us three goes in Sacramento to get the law passed, but it's been, it's been in there for many years. 
And that is something that I reminded the bank yesterday when I went over there with my neighbor and said, you know what, you should be doing a lot more to um, stop my neighbor from withdrawing this money because you are mandated. Uh, and, and anyway, so I don't get me started on this, but yes, every single uh, employee of a financial institution in California is mandated to re report suspected financial elder abuse. And the, and the term is immediately. Next question. Um, I get a lot of robocalls. I always hang up, but all of the, are all of them deceitful? Oh, I would say uh, pretty much everyone is a deceitful to some extent. <laughs> um, and so it is a plague on all of us. And uh, I've actually gone and uh, uh, purchased an app. Um, hi, Rosie. Hi. Rosie's there. So um, <laughs> I, I went and purchased uh, an app uh, that that blocks many of these robo calls and then has a recording on it that imitates uh, my voice or uh, it's a it's a great entertainment actually but it does cut down on the number of nuisance calls that you can get okay uh why would albertson's uh, sell twenty three thousand dollars in gift cards that's a great question um and i hope they wouldn't is my answer but I don't know because unfortunately, oh, I got a robo call coming in right now. <laughs> so let me just hang up on here. Hold on. Yeah, it's probably a scam. So um, uh, I'm hoping that Albertsons have trained their staff to say, wait a minute, uh, uh, you, um, you shouldn't be taking out all this money. But unfortunately, they get a commission on the gift cards that they sell. So there may be a profit motive to prevent them from discouraging the buyer. And that's similar to the next question. Are stores mandated to report seniors buying regular and large gift cards? No, that's a great question. No, but you know what? Uh, it, it, it's something that we should be looking at because the, the, the more and more the crooks are looking into gift cards to be the conduit for the transmission of funds. It used to be a wire transfer, it used to be MoneyGram, it used to be Western Union, but actually Western Union and MoneyGram are doing a better job of deterring the customer from sending that money. So um, maybe this is something that we should be looking at. So this one is um, uh, more about your, your kind of your transition in your life. Let me see if I can find it again. Uh, I know you've been traveling around the U.S. and internationally since retiring from the county to help educate people about elder abuse issues. Has the, pan has the pandemic curtailed your efforts or are you finding ways like this to deliver the message virtually? Well, that's great. Yes, it's definitely anchored me to my home. Um, I am, I think, born to be a traveler. I love to travel. Uh, I love to uh, speak in front of a live audience. Um, but Given the circumstances, it doesn't look like my wife and I will be traveling anywhere for the next few months anyway. So um, this is the next best thing. And I'm just so thankful for modern technology to be able to do this. But yeah, given the choice, I would much rather be doing it in front of a live audience. Do you have, uh, or what piece of advice would you have uh, for an adult child with, elder, with an elderly parent with caregiver issues? <laughs> This is very important. Um, if, if we are facing a situation where we have to hire a caregiver to come in and take care of a, a, an elderly parent, the first thing I always tell uh, adult children to do is write a letter to your parents' bank or credit union branch manager and let them know of the change in circumstances and let them know that you are asking them to, spe to pay special attention to your parent's bank account or credit union account, remind them that they are mandated reporters and to make sure that if there is any unusual change in the parent's financial pattern of behavior, they should immediately alert adult protective services and or law enforcement. And I think by having that letter in on the desk of the branch manager of the credit union or the bank, that places a huge responsibility now on the institution to make sure that your elderly parents' finances are secure. So that if something goes wrong and if the caregiver does get hold of the debit card and does start withdrawing lots of money, which I've prosecuted so many cases of doing that, then at least you can re refer to that letter and say, where were you, bank? 
You are responsible. You need to return that money right now to my parents' bank account. Okay, uh, one more question we have time for. And remember, Paul, if you don't mind to, maybe you could bring up your uh, contact information one more time while I'm getting this question to you. Um, I will do that. I'll share my screen. And do you have any suggestions for how to stop unwanted mail? Um, good question. Uh, not really, because uh, um, other than just returning it, um, uh, no. I, I mean, what I do say, though, about mail is this. None of us should have an unlocked mailbox. Uh, we all have got to figure out a way to secure our mailboxes because mailbox theft in itself is a huge, huge problem in San Diego County. Um, but I really don't have a solution to unwanted, unsolicited mail. We're, we're going to get it, even if we try to put a stop on certain companies from sending it uh, to us. So as a result, um, when you get unsolicited credit card uh, offers, you don't want those sitting in an unlocked mailbox because if the crook gets hold of them then all kinds of damage can be done to us okay unfortunately we don't have enough time there was a couple other questions uh one maybe you can just answer quickly would a bank uh, pay attention to a le letter if the bank account is only in the parent's name and then also can you ha have a send a similar letter that you would describe earlier from adult children to credit card companies that you would send to the bank in terms of um uh, uh issues with caregivers sorry your audio broke up there sorry are you what's the question about sending a similar letter to credit yes card a similar letter that we, you would uh, re uh recommended sending to a, a credit union in terms of uh, uh caregivers assistance with a caregiver um a, a credit union yes absolutely credit union bank even the credit card companies. credit card company okay. yes credit card companies right and, and what I would also recommend, and, and this is something that's happened since COVID-19, the three agencies that run our credit, um, Experian, Equifax, and TransUnion, are allowing us through a website called annualcreditreport.com, I think it is, or .org.com, uh, to do a free credit search every week. And so I think we should encourage our parents to make use of that just to make sure that nobody has seized their information and uh, applied for a credit card in their name. Thank you. And one that I can answer, a question that I can answer. Um, we, somebody asked if we have recorded this and we, we have recorded it. Um, we will be posting the video at a later date. Give us a little time to uh, make sure to take my mug out of it before we actually post it. Just kidding. I mean, I, I dressed up for you guys, okay? Uh, and we will get that to you. And then Paul, thank you again for just the presentation, but um, for also sharing um, some condensed slides with us because there's such great information in there that we will also be able to post on our website. Some like the top 10 tips and things like that are just real things that I think um, folks would find very valuable. My pleasure. Well, again, it's a great chance just to uh, see names, see people, that I have very fond memories of working with. Uh, again, Mark, thanks for all you do, for all the association does for all of us. And uh, I hope that many of us will be able to celebrate our 100th birthday and still be getting that monthly installment at the end of the month that I always look forward <laughs> to. That's right. And don't, and don't forget all you uh, ResDeck members out there and guests, thank you again. And uh, go out and recruit some members for us. You're ambassadors for ResDeck and uh, whatever other friends that you have that maybe are colleagues that are retired as well um, and they don't, maybe don't know about us, send them to our website. We got all the information there on how to become a member. And once again, we appreciate your membership a great deal and we thank you for your participation today. Thank you, Paul. My pleasure. Bye, everybody. I'm going to end the meeting for everybody now. Okay. Have a great rest of your day.